This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by IBM. Big data at the speed of business. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. I want to welcome members of our armed forces, particularly those who are serving our country on foreign soil and who are joining us over the Internet today. Thank you for being with us. In just a moment, one of the world's leading economists and experts on globalization will be joining us to correct our impression that the world is headed toward a single uniform economy. Mr. Pankaj Gemawat, an authority who you won't hear nearly enough of in the mainstream media, is going to dispel the memes we have about the effects of globalization. But before he joins us, as is my custom each week, let me tell you a little bit about Mr. Gemawat. Pankaj Gemawat was born in India. Mr. Gemawat's eyewitness account of the transformation of India had an indelible effect on his ability to see the critical role culture plays in economic development. Gemawat earned his undergraduate degree in economics from Harvard University and was admitted into the prestigious Harvard Business School at the young age of 19 years old. He worked for McKinsey and Company for a short period before joining the faculty at Harvard Business School, where he taught for 25 years and has the distinction of being the youngest full professor in the school's history. And since 2006, Gamawat has been serving as professor of global strategy at the IESE Business School in Barcelona. He is the author of several landmark books on economics, most notably his latest titled World 3.0, global prosperity and how to achieve it. He has been the recipient of numerous awards, including the Irwin Award, the McKinsey Award, the IESE Economics for Management Award, and many others for his advanced research in the field of globalization. And in 2011, he was named one of the top 50 most influential management gurus by the Harvard Business Review. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Costa Report, global economist and strategist, Mr. Pankaj Gemawat. Thank you for joining us today. Pleased to be here. Now, most of our listeners are not economists, so I thought we could start with a a question which may may sound basic, but I think will form the basis for today's conversation. What do we mean by the term globalization? Well, I think most people tend to think of it as connections between uh, countries, connections that span national borders along a range of dimensions. economic, political, cultural, geographic, etc. And there's sometimes also an implicit assumption that this is all uh, this is continuously going up uh, all the time. So sometimes people refer to the increase in this connection uh, in this degree of connection as globalization, but uh, the two are quite different really and one fits with reality, the other doesn't. Now, most of us have the impression that technologies such as lightning-fast communications and the Internet have made economies much more interdependent to the point where a failed subprime mortgage policy in the U.S. had the power to send the world into a global recession. Is that impression wrong? Well, I mean, I certainly think that um, one of the things we've learned in the last five years is that fear flies across borders faster than just about anything else, including fundamentals. And so in my own work on globalization, in my book, World 3.0, et cetera, I have warned continuously about short-run financial flows as potentially destabilizing and things that we need to really sort of pay attention to, uh, debt of all kinds, uh, arguably some components of stock uh, short-run uh, portfolio equity investment as well. So, you know, there is, uh, there is certainly that particular downside, but I think that what most people still think of when they think of the world really being totally connected is uh, technology as much as financial fears and therefore i'd like to ask your listeners to perform a little thought experiment Mm -hmm. let's think of all the people on facebook what percentage of their friends on average are from the same country as those people themselves and remember 
that Facebook is the kind of technology that in principle at equal cost or lack of cost should make it easy for us to befriend people halfway around the world as much as people next door. We certainly have that impression that social media means instant communication <clears throat> on a globalized basis. Mm -hmm. So I'm, um, I'm sort of asking your listeners to first pick a percentage in terms of trying to think of, okay, what percentage of friends on Facebook on average are non-domestic? Uh, the answer turns out to be about 15%. Really? So 85% from the same country, 15% from other countries, and that's because, hopefully at least, we don't friend people at random on Facebook. Uh, the technology is overlaid on some pre-existing ties, which are mostly local, and so to sort of, you know, focus just on the technology and ignore the importance of those pre-existing ties is to really sort of overstate how much technology has changed actual levels of connectedness as opposed to offering us the potential for connectivity. I'm not sure we don't friend people at random. I think we have 100,000 <laughs> yeah, well, people on my Facebook. Some people do. Uh, yeah, I mean, we have 100,000 people following us on Facebook, and I promise you uh, those were not people I have met and, and have an intimate connection with. Well, uh, I think once one achieves a certain level of celebrity, uh, all bets are off. But in general... Uh, you know, if you look at the typical person on Facebook with a couple of hundred friends, etc., that's sort of mostly what the picture is going to look like. And so it's a little bit of a reminder that technology makes it easier, but it doesn't mean we'll necessarily use that potential to get outside our own bubbles, as it were. That's right. So, so your research has indicated that uh, there's only about 15% of our Facebook friends that are outside of our native country. Right. Wow. And 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 yet that seems to compete, and that kind of information seems to compete with what Thomas Friedman advocates, which is the world is getting flatter and flatter, and that uh, cultural and country borders really don't matter anymore. Yeah, so, you know, yeah, so the Friedman book's interesting partly because uh, uh, I reckon it sold about as many copies as all other books written about globalization ever combined. Yes. So it's clearly had a huge impact on how people frame the basic narrative with the basic idea that, you know, geography and soon even language won't matter. So the book was published, I think, about nine years ago, mm -hmm. and it's sort of worth looking at what the principal example had talked about, the Indian IT sector, as an example. This is apparently what suggested to Friedman Indian uh, Software Development Services. Yes. Seems to be what suggested to Friedman that the world was getting flat. I don't know. So I know a little bit about the sector. I spent uh, more than 10 years working as the chief strategy advisor to the largest Indian software firm. Uh, turns out that, you know, 80% plus of Indian software exports, nine years after the world was quickly getting flat, are still to English-speaking markets. The sh share of English-speaking markets in profitability is greater than 100%. So... Indian software firms are making pushes into continental Europe, et cetera, but, uh, and learning French and German as second and third languages and so forth. But so far, in general, those efforts haven't been profitable. And probably most strikingly, um, you know, the wages of Indian software programmers, which is really what powers this whole thing, are still only about one-fifth to one-sixth the wages of U.S.-based software programmers. And if the world really were flat, you would have expected, you know, prices to equalize along that dimension. Mm -hmm. When we come back, we're going to find out why the biggest threat to globalization might come from preventable policy fumbles. You're listening to the Costa Report. Did you know that every day we create 2.5 quintillion bytes of data and that 90% of the data in the world today has been created in the last two years alone? 
This data comes from everywhere and it affects everyone. This data is big data. Big data is all data, and it's more than simply a matter of size. Big data represents an opportunity to uncover new insights, make your business more agile, and answer questions that were previously beyond your reach. IBM's big data platform uses sophisticated technologies and patented advanced analytics designed to complement your existing information infrastructure. The IBM Big Data platform allows you to get started quickly today and expand to address more complex problems tomorrow. It doesn't matter where you start, it matters that you start. Find out how IBM can help you turn big data into a competitive advantage by visiting ibm.com slash big data today. Every day our world gets more complicated. Not only is new information coming at us faster than we can manage, new regulations, technology, and the effects of globalization have made it much more difficult to succeed. That's why I wrote The Watchman's Rattle, a book that, for the first time, explains how complexity makes it hard to separate facts from fiction and eventually causes us to make important decisions based on unproven beliefs. And not just us, our leaders also fall prey to this phenomena. But here's the good news. Once you know the symptoms to watch for, you can safeguard against them. So please, go to RebeccaCosta.com. That's RebeccaCosta.com. And order your copy of The Watchman's Rattle. It only takes a few minutes and the shipping is free. That's RebeccaCosta.com. Do it now. You'll be glad you did. As I went through school, one giant question loomed over me. What did I want to be? But in order to know what I wanted to be, I had to first decide what I wanted to make. I wanted to make more. So I became a teacher. Now I make learning a privilege, not a chore. And frustration a tool, not an obstacle. I make working hard seem easy and giving up impossible. I make an old subject feel like a fresh thought and unconventional methods common. I make material things less important, and little things like patience and kindness count. I make weekdays more exciting than weekends, and classrooms feel like anything but. I make things different, which is all I ever hoped for. I'm a teacher. I make more. Find out how you can make more at teach.org. Make more. Teach. Brought to you by Teach and the Ad Council. When I grow up, I want to be a new pair of blue jeans. When I grow up, I want to be a kid's first computer. When I grow up, I want to be a glass countertop in a new home. When I grow up, I want to be a kid's best birthday present. When I grow up, I want to be a football stadium. When I grow up, I want to be a warm place on a cold day. When I grow up, I want to be a fancy backsplash. I want to be a bike that races around the when country. When I grow up, I want to be a bench on a forest when I trail. Grow up, I want to be a rocking chair on when a sunny up, porch. I want to be a skyscraper. I want to be. 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 When I grow up, I don't want to be a piece of garbage. And if you recycle me, I won't be. Give your garbage another life. Recycle. Learn how at IWantToBeRecycled.org. A public service advertisement brought to you by Keep America Beautiful and the Ad Council. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is renowned global economist, Mr. Pankaj Gemawat. Before the break, we were talking about the impact that Thomas Friedman's book, The World is Flat, has had on our perception of the uniformity and interconnectedness between countries, which the facts do not necessarily support some nine years later. Now, as I understand it, you've developed a depth index of globalization, something called the DIG. Can you explain what that index is to our audience today and why that index is important? So I think uh, the first step in uh, constructing something like DIG was, of course, the realization that the world is far from perfectly flat, uh, because if all countries were really totally connected with everything else, there'd be no point in trying to measure differences in the extent to which different countries were actually connected with the rest of the world. 
So the logical next step after figuring out that, well, you know, it's more interesting to uh, pay attention to variations and how connected things are rather than just assuming everything's already perfectly connected, was to try and measure these things at uh, the country level. And uh, the work, which has been going on for three years now, does a couple of things. Uh, First of all, it takes a broader view of... uh, globalization than the usual treatment focused just on trade and foreign direct investment. So we look at cross-border information flows and people flows as well. And that matters, for instance, because in 2012, uh, trade was de- trade intensity, tra- uh, world trade as a percentage of world GDP was down marginally mm-hmm. compared to the previous year. Foreign direct investment was down by a lot. But there continued to be increases in the people and informational cross-border flows, which over time tend to feed and be reinforced by trade and capital flows. So the picture wasn't quite as bleak as people who focused very narrowly on trade and foreign direct investment would have concluded looking at the data for 2012. It's a little bit more positive than that view would imply. I see. So in looking at these indexes, we could have a case where, if I understand what you just said, uh, trade could look down, uh, foreign investment could look down relative to uh, interconnectedness between countries, but we could see a movement or migration of individuals between those countries as well as information flow. So the indexes might not all track the same way. No, exactly, and they haven't over the last uh, few years. So capital flows are basically down a lot relative to uh, pre-crisis highs. Trade is basically almost back to the same level, and what has increased are uh, the people flows to some extent, and of course, even more spectacularly, the cross-border information flows. So uh, it's a little bit of a reminder that, you know, if you really think of globalization as multiple forms of connectedness, which I think is one of the standard things that people who try and define the term tend to agree on, looking at just trade and capital is pretty narrow. Yes, I agree. So you've expanded the index, and uh, according to your index, which countries are the most globalized and which seem to be the least? Well, uh, you know, top, uh, you know, uh, top in terms of just sheer intensity of globalization is uh, Singapore, which, uh, you know, of course, is uh, one of the countries that uh, is uh, serves as a big re-export center. So you actually have Singapore's exports uh, exceeding its GDP, uh, you know, which is only possible because it really serves as a transshipment center, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, uh, Singapore sort of, you know, uh, traditionally ranks uh, like most relatively small economies, relatively high on these kinds of indices. And uh, what uh, sort of, you know, what you tend to find fairly far down are countries that, you know, are relatively poor, uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, I think the exact bottom of our list of 139 for 2012, interestingly enough, was Iran, suggesting that the sanctions were having some effect because that was lower than Iran had previously placed. So that's another thing about our index. There are other indices of globalization around. Most of them are issued with a multiple year lag. So they're just getting around to looking at the first responses to the crisis, the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, as it were, and don't really help with policy assessments on were the sanctions against Iran working, at, at least as far as one can tell from you know what macroeconomic data on a cross-country comparable basis we do have for Iran. And where did the United States stack up in terms of the DIG index? Uh, And have we been trending upward or downward in recent years? Yeah, somehow I figured that might come up. And, uh, (laughs) you know, and it's a little bit of a reminder of how in a allegedly many of us still think flat world, how many of our concerns really are about how did my country do? Because uh, 
whenever I talk about the index anywhere, that usually tends to be about the first order of business. Um, how did we rank and how did that shift relative to last year? So the U.S. is, first of all, a uh, relatively large economy, uh, the largest in the world by far, actually. And so you expect large economies to have lower intensity of trade than small economies. I mean, if you were just Robinson Crusoe mm -hmm. on an island with an island with good connections to the rest of the world, uh, you'd have a pretty high trade intensity, I expect, even if you could find employment for yourself. So... Uh, so the U.S. Uh, ranks low partly because it is so large, but still it's interesting to look at the variations across the different pillars. Where the U.S. ranks really, really low is in terms of trade intensity, which comes as news to people who think of, oh boy, you know, the U.S. is so wide open to imports, etc. cetera. Um, U.S. in terms of trade intensity ranks 138th out of 139 countries. Wow. Uh, I think Brazil is the only one that ranks lower, which comes as a bit of a shock to Brazilians when I present the data in Brazil. The U.S. does relatively better on the capital flow and the information flow pillars. And again, not quite as badly as on trade, but relatively poorly in terms of uh, cross-border people flows. So, you know, um, for instance, on partly because of the excellence of U.S. universities, doubtless, but it ranks 125th out of the 125 countries we have data for on outbound international students actually pursuing degrees abroad. Wow. Now, you That's mentioned really that the size really of the economy, thing. yeah, you mentioned the size of the economy plays a big role in that. So yep. is that low trade intensity relative to the size of the economy? Would you attribute it to that? Yeah, there there is still some evidence that overall the U.S. ranks a little bit lower on uh, of these measure, uh, overall measures of connectedness than one would expect after you run a regression trying to control for the size of the economy, yes. the level of uh, economic development as measured by per capita income, which also matters, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a, it's a relatively slight tendency. I find it more interesting to think about you know, why such huge variation across uh, different uh, uh, across different categories and particularly to pick, thing, pick things up like uh, relatively very few U.S. students are studying abroad. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll pick that up on the other side of the break. We have to take another break. Stay right where you are. You're listening to the Costa Report. Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. Strawberries blueberries, blackberries, and raspberries. Dole has a bounty of berries ripe for the picking. Fresh berries are not only delicious, but some of the most powerful disease-fighting foods available. Researchers have found that berries have some of the highest antioxidant levels of any fresh fruits. So add a handful or two of your favorite berries to your next meal and enjoy their nutritional benefits and natural sweetness in all of your dishes. From salads to desserts, and everything in between. For fresh tips and ideas from Dole's berry experts, visit berries.dole.com. And be sure to check out the pages of mouth-watering recipes. Whether it's a sweet and savory blueberry cranberry chicken salad or a simple strawberry sorbet, Dole has the perfect berry to inspire your next berrylicious dish. This is Namdi Asamoah. I play football for the Philadelphia Eagles, but what I do off the field with United Way might be more important. I'm a volunteer tutor and mentor. Why? Because over a million kids a year drop out of school, and that's not okay. It takes 12 years to create a graduate, but it takes about the same time to create a dropout. And the difference between a child becoming one or the other could be me, or it could be you. Studies show that if we get to these kids earlier, their chances are better. And kids who read well by third grade are more likely to graduate. So join me in United Way. Suit up and take the pledge. Become a volunteer reader, tutor, or mentor. Because when a child succeeds, we all succeed. Give. Advocate. Volunteer. Live United. Take the pledge at unitedway.org. 
brought to you by United Way, the Ad Council, and the National Football League. Take an ordinary putty knife and scrape off the old wax ring. Place the new wax ring over the flange, then line up the bolts with the bowl and gently set in place, making sure a proper seal is created with the flange and drain. Next. Um, Dad? Uh, yeah, sweetie. Is that an old plumbing manual? Oh, um, yeah, yeah, honey. We really need to get some new books. Right, um, do, do you want me to stop? Nah, I kind of want to know how it ends. Okay, tighten the bolts, line up the flushing valve to the opening in the top of the bowl, and secure the tank with a screwdriver and crescent wrench. <laughs> the smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Call 877-4DAD-411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Wildfires burn millions of acres across the country each year. And each year, wildland firefighters battle to contain them. But they can't do it alone. For some communities, it's not a question of if wildfires strike, but when. And a single ember can travel more than one mile. As it twists and turns and floats through the air, that single ember can find its way to where you live and can ignite and destroy your home or your community. That single ember can be just as dangerous as the wildfire itself. You can't control where the ember will land, but you can control what happens when it does. You can take action now to prepare your home and your community for wildfire. Get fire adapted. Learn what you can do now to reduce wildfire damage later at fireadapted.org. Prepare, protect, prevail. A public service message brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service and the Ad Council. Learn more at fireadapted.org. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and if you're just joining us, my guest today is Pankaj Gamawat, who was explaining that the United States ranks second to the bottom of 139 countries in terms of global trade intensity and also ranks low in terms of the number of U.S. students studying abroad. Is that right? Uh, Yes, last, actually, on that measure that we've got for 125 countries. Uh, Now, does that have to do with the quality of education in the United States? Because uh, you were born in India, and you came to the United States, in fact, to study at Harvard uh, Business School as well. So does that have something to do with the quality of education? It's a huge edge that the U.S. has. And so, you know, some of the countries that uh, rank really highly on this index, because you always do have to look at a country-by-country basis for specific reasons for particular patterns, Zimbabwe ranks really highly because their educational system is unfortunately been ravaged by what's been going on there for you know decades now. Yes. So part of it is the strength of the U.S. system, but at a time when you know there's this huge focus on exports, on you know for instance um, changing some of those low trade intensity figures that we were talking about, whether it's helpful for so few proportionately. U.S. students to study overseas, that uh, the U.S. ranks last globally on this measure, one wonders. Yeah, you wonder what the long-term effects of that will be. Right. Yeah. Now, I'd, I'd like to and shift the... Course, U.S. universities are terrific. They're a huge competitive asset, um, much more so than you know other levels of the U.S. educational system, because I think there's a lot of questioning right now about the U.S. school system. But the universities are terrific, but still, in terms of Americans uh, traveling outside the U.S. on the kind of long-run sort of thing that uh, going overseas for a degree tends to bring, it does seem a bit low. Yes. Now, I'd like to shift the conversation slightly to a shocking paper you released earlier this year about five factors which can affect uh, career advancement. And I have to say, I doubt any of these five factors are on most listeners' radar because uh, you brought a perspective to the table, which I have never considered, and that's the number of board members and managers in a company who are from a foreign country. Can you speak to that for a moment? Yeah. So this started off with just a fun little project to look at. Okay, you know, we uh, uh, I was working with a collaborator, Herman Van Trappen, who really specializes in human resources because I'm not an HR person. 
And we were intrigued by this notion that companies were way less globalized in terms of their personnel, especially at the top, than they were in terms of their even their sales or profit footprint of the sort that we talked about with the Indian IT sector, for instance. Mm-hmm. And so we started to try and measure what percentage of the CEOs of the Fortune Global 500 were actually from a country other than the uh, country where the company they headed was headquartered and came to the conclusion, well, last uh, summer 2013, it was about 13%. For companies that derive the bulk of their sales from outside their home market, et cetera. Since then, we've uh, done some further work and pointed out that this measure really turns out to be very highly correlated with the percentage of uh, non non natives on the board of directors and the percentage of uh, you know people in the top management team as in reporting directly to the CEO who are non natives mm-hmm. so it's a useful summary statistic and then you start to find all kinds of interesting patterns around this basic relationship like for instance um, company uh, countries that tend to uh, be relatively globalized in the terms uh, that we measure it in in our globalization index in my other work also tend to be the ones that tend to be the most receptive to non-native CEOs. Uh, The BRIC countries are much less receptive, companies headquartered in BRIC countries, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, much less receptive uh, to having uh, non-native CEOs. We found two cases out of the 125 uh, companies from those countries that are in the Fortune Global 500. And so one of the things that I tell my students uh, when we conclude our course on globalization with some discussion of what this means for them is rather than having this picture of companies as, you know, multinationals in particular, shipping large numbers of people around the world and letting them advance seamlessly up the ranks, Companies do very greatly in terms of the opportunities that they appear to afford to non-nationals. And this is a helpful thing to think about as you do your career planning. Absolutely. Now, were there specific companies that had more diverse boards, uh, had a CEO yes. who was not from a native comp- uh, country, that yes, you it's, could it's see really where that really advancement small. was? Uh-huh. <laughs> It's really the small European countries where you see a lot of this going on. Mm -hmm. So the Switzerland's, the Belgium's, the Netherlands. uh, And you can think why. I mean, these are small enough countries that their firms have had to deal with foreign markets for a very, very long time. To the point where you look at something like Nestle, I think 95% of their sales are outside Switzerland. In a situation like that, um, and, you know, again, this is something we confirm in the data, The more transnational your company is, which is correlated with also being from a relatively small country, the more likely it is that it's going to have, uh, you know, more non-natives involved in it. Right, but this sounds like a simple supply and demand issue. If you're looking for uh, PhDs in physics or engineer and you happen to have a company here in the United States, you've got a large pool to choose from. Uh, if it's a country like Belgium, you may not have as many experts in special in specialized fields to select from. So wouldn't it be logical that you'd go outside your country to yeah, find those people? No, but you're, you're exactly right, and this is exactly like the trade argument we were making earlier about some of what we see with the really low U.S. trade intensity is, of course, the fact that the U.S. is the largest economy in the world. Right. So, again, you know, uh, I think the difference between U.S. and Switzerland, as you correctly point out, might be uh, simply the artifact of, uh, of the U.S. being so much larger than Switzerland. But then you look at Japan, which is still the third largest economy in the world, they're way lower than the U.S. and the small European countries in terms of percentage of foreign CEOs. So you do start to see some national variations. Were there any in Japan? I lived in Japan for 16 years, and I cannot even imagine uh, a Japanese uh, company. There might have been one or two. I think Harry Stringer would have uh, qualified at one point. I forget whether Olympus... uh, 
the scandal-ridden one where the foreign CEO blew the whistle on the Japanese insiders clearly was, if not an entirely successful, um, from anybody's perspective, uh, certainly an experiment in this direction. Mm -hmm. But you can kind of see why, um, yeah, uh, this does conform um, to uh, some of the other things people have said about Japanese enterprises. And... uh, I must confess, having once led a discussion of diversity amongst uh, a group of more than 150 Japanese HR managers in Tokyo, because I do live dangerously from time to time, (laughs) I was struck by the sort of almost utter absence of women from the room in any capacity other than, you know, as tea ladies. Uh, Very struck by the absence of, I think there was one obviously non-Japanese face amongst the attendees and uh you know it's uh you know something to keep in mind as you think about um you know employment of prospects with multinationals from different parts of the world there yes, are obviously well. large variations across companies and my guess is you know it's not surprising that sony was the first major japanese company to go for a foreign head uh, they've always been a little bit more open than the sort of longer established uh, uh, business groups like Toyota, et cetera. Yes, that, that's right. But I, uh, you know, I think at one time Japan was probably positioned to be a Singapore-like uh, import-export hub. Uh, but I do think that the cultural issues in Japan, and I, like yes. I said, I spent more than a decade and a half Uh, in the Japanese economy. So I think the cultural issues really got in their way. Uh Now we have to take our our last break, uh, but we'll be back with Mr. Jemawat and more globalization. You're listening to the Costa Report. One of my new customs is to put open bottles of red and white wine on my table so my guests can serve themselves. But not just any wine. In my home, I want to serve the best, and that's wine from Caraccioli Cellars. So this year, I asked winemaker Scott Caraccioli for a suggestion on what I should serve. Come dinner time, it's always a good idea to have a bottle of nice Chardonnay as well as Pinot Noir on your table. That way you have a selection for every guest that walks through your door. But the best way to start the evening is definitely with a bottle of bubbles, preferably Brut Rosé, to really get the celebration in, in the mode of the holidays. Oh, you're absolutely right. It's, there's something about the bubbles that gets everybody going. Yeah, it's really a an infusion of happiness. <laughs> That's a great way to put it. So I'll start with the bubbles and then move on to the red and white on my table, and then I'll have everyone covered. Unless people want to keep going with the bubbles, which I always advise. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Are you looking for a keynote speaker for your next company meeting, symposium, training event, or exposition? For over 50 years, the American Program Bureau has been bringing the world's most respected leaders and thinkers together with audiences in every industry, from healthcare, technology, education, and finance, to manufacturing and entertainment. American Program Bureau speakers inspire and motivate. In fact, no one has more experience matching the right speaker to the right event. Whether it's Mikhail Gorbachev, Desmond Tutu, John Stewart, or Richard Branson, the American Program Bureau offers speakers on every topic. And how do I know so much about the American Program Bureau? Because I'm an APB speaker myself. To contact the American Program Bureau to book a speaker for your next event, go to apbspeakers.com. That's apbspeakers.com. Or phone 800-225-4575. This is Namdi Asamoah. I play football for the Philadelphia Eagles, but what I do off the field with United Way might be more important. I'm a volunteer tutor and mentor. Why? Because over a million kids a year drop out of school, and that's not okay. It takes 12 years to create a graduate, but it takes about the same time to create a dropout. And the difference between a child becoming one or the other could be me, or it could be you. Studies show that if we get to these kids earlier, their chances are better. And kids who read well by third grade are more likely to graduate. So join me in United Way. Suit up and take the pledge. Become a volunteer reader, tutor, or mentor. Because when a child succeeds, we all succeed. Give. Advocate. Volunteer. 
Live United. Take the pledge at unitedway.org. Brought to you by United Way, the Ad Council, and the National Football League. Take an ordinary putty knife and scrape off the old wax ring. Place the new wax ring over the flange, then line up the bolts with the bowl and gently set in place, making sure a proper seal is created with the flange and drain. Next. Um, Dad? Uh, yeah, sweetie. Is that an old plumbing manual? Oh, um, yeah, yeah, honey. We really need to get some new books. Right, um, do you, do you want me to stop? Nah, I kind of want to know how it ends. Okay, tighten the bolts, line up the flushing valve to the opening in the top of the bowl, and secure the tank with a screwdriver and crescent wrench. <laughs> the smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Call 877-4DAD-411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is global economist and strategist Pankaj Gemawat. So let's take a moment to tackle another myth that uh, corporations are investing less in operations at home and investing more of their equity in setting up operations and increasing jobs overseas. What did your research reveal about our fears that large companies are investing more and more abroad? Well, uh, sort of it's been interesting to look just at, uh, since people generally tend to look at data that's a few years out of date, I thought I would just sort of you know try and focus on looking in detail at recent changes. And so with another colleague, we looked at the... Uh, there's some data that a group called Orvis pulls together on the Fortune Global 500 that has detailed information on all their investments around the world. And for the 12-month period that we looked at, you know, basically through to about uh, roughly this time or a bit later last year, those 12 months, what we basically saw was a pattern in which Western multinationals in particular were pulling back rather than expanding their global footprint. Uh, companies from Asia, some Japanese, but presumably more, you know, the, the Chinese companies that have emerged as a major force, mm-hmm. especially numerically in the Fortune Global 500, were still expanding. But uh, the overall picture, which is also consistent with this drop off in foreign direct investment intensity that we talked about, is that on average, um, the multinationals, despite the fact that they're sitting on, you know, in many cases, record stockpiles of cash, give, despite the fact that many stock markets are near all time highs, which uh, are the kinds of things that historically trigger merger waves, including cross border mergers. There's been relatively little of that going on, and that's where one worries that what's going on is really a fear that although the basic fundamentals still look pretty good compared to the 1980s, the 1990s, or the first 10 years of this century, that somehow policy fumbles might prevent us from taking full advantage. And so companies still seem in a sort of wait-and-see mode um, about uh, foreign direct investment, at least in the Western world, and particularly lots of sort of second and third guessing going on right now about their strategies for emerging markets. So give us an idea of a policy fumble which would cause countries to retract from investments overseas. Well, um, so uh, just yesterday I was in uh, The Hague having a discussion, including with people from the Dutch Prime Minister's office, about uh, uh, the Netherlands' relationship with the EU. And while it was not tactful to bring this up directly, the point is that uh, Gert Wilders has released this white paper proposing that the Netherlands would be much better outside the European Union Mm -hmm. than within it. Uh, you can see similar stirrings across much of the continent, you know, ranging from France and the Front National to the UK Independence Party. Just suppose that, you know, um, and this might be more an electoral fumble than a policy fumble. Just imagine that this kind of agenda actually came to influence European policymaking in the next couple of years. Mm-hmm. That would be 
catastrophic for Europe and would have huge knock-on effects on the world economy if we were to see the Eurozone fall apart or even worse, the European Union start to unravel with large numbers of countries deciding they're better outside than inside. Britain is already, according to Cameron, if he's reelected, will have a referendum on the issue. So that's an example of the sort of avoidable policy fumble that might yet happen. One can think of domestic, purely domestic dysfunction in the U.S. around the budget. So I frankly was very pleased and a bit surprised to see that things didn't go down to the wire in December. But as we've learned, uh, there's a lot of kicking the can down the road on this stuff. Sure, sure. So a nation's debt policy on how they're going to treat their debt, how they treat their currency. Uh, And, you know, in Europe, there's many that will argue that uh, if the European Union comes apart, there'll be more diversity amongst the economies and particularly those that are dependent on the euro because the euro has, you know, demonstrated that it doesn't take more than one or two countries to get that currency in trouble. Yeah, in retrospect, and I remember asking um, a monetary historian this question about 20 years ago when the euro was formed, like, what did history demonstrate about currency unions? Yeah. And his one sentence answer was, currency unions without political unions don't work. Yes. Uh, And, you know, what we've seen is that play out. I think there's general agreement that, you know, the eurozone is wider than an optimal currency zone would be in terms of the differences in business productivity levels and a range of other things that one might want to think about. And so, you know, the question is, how does one uh, make this, uh, you know, uh, how does one resolve this problem as best as possible? Because I think technically there's general consensus that, yes, it is possible. It's not that, you know, European countries are totally without, collectively, without the resources necessary It was interesting, even though I'm an evolutionary biologist by training, I was asked about the euro, which I can't imagine why anybody would ask me when they asked me about (laughs) it. It's one of those things that, you know, it's uh, it's like the weather in sort of business slash financial (laughs) circles. Uh, If nothing else, you know, you can always talk about how the currencies are doing. Right, right. Stock market indices are the other obvious. They asked me about it, and I said, well, in nature, any drive toward singularity is a drive toward extinction, so take that for whatever you like, but when you start to drive to any singular model on a global basis, uh, you know, the susceptibility for instantaneous collapse increases, and and uh, so they went off and they reforged that into some headline <laughs> that I, I really didn't say, but uh, but it was oh, nice. It, it got, yeah. got us a lot of press, so we're appreciative of that, I guess, in the long run. Now, before we run out of time, uh, is there a website where listeners could go to read your articles and also to get your book? Yeah, www com has the depth index of globalization and has the other thing that I think your readers might find, uh, your uh, listeners might find very interesting has to do, and this is a not for pay feature of the website, um, are the maps that I have of the world resized according to things like who trades with whom, where does BMW really derive its production volumes from versus its sales things like that that do help make this point about not just globalization being limited, but also expose something about the patterns around the cross-border interactions that we do see. Yes, I think it's very important because this program is dedicated to getting facts out and busting myths that we have. And we and one of the things that I do admire very much about your work is that regardless of what conclusions people draw, you're allowing them to see the facts on globalization so that we can make more informed decisions and have more informed opinions. That is our program for today, but before we say goodbye, I want to thank you for helping us separate those facts about globalization and clearing up some of our misunderstandings. Thank you for being with us, Mr. Gamowat. Thanks very much for having me on the show. 
If your station is leaving us after this hour and you have a question or a comment to make about today's program, you can email me at RebeccaCosta.com or send me a note on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and let me know how you feel about our conversation with Mr. Gamawat today. And if you missed the full interview or if you missed any interview with any of our guests, remember that you can download previous episodes of the Costa Report from our website, Apple iTunes, Podbean, and our new YouTube channel. Uh, perhaps you agree with Thomas Friedman that the world is getting flatter, or perhaps Gamma Watt changed that perception by pointing to how much less integrated and interdependent we really are today. I'm interested to hear what you think. So go to our website at RebeccaCosta.com and click on the contact page and leave your comments there. And, and if it's well thought out, well... I might just read it on the air for all of our listeners' benefit and for my benefit, so so keep your comments coming. And while you're at our website, take a moment to order a copy of The Watchman's Rattle, the first book to show how accelerating complexity leads to gridlock, irrational public policy, and eventually collapse. And not just in modern times. These same symptoms occurred prior to the collapse of the great Mayan, Roman, and Khmer empires. And once you know what the signs are, well, you'll be armed with what you need to succeed in an environment where there are many more wrong choices than right ones. So go to RebeccaCosta.com and get your copy of The Watchman's Rattle. That's RebeccaCosta.com, my name, dot com. Uh, This is one book I promise you're not going to want to put down, so get your copy today. Now stay tuned for a second hour of Straight Talk Radio when we hear what you have on your mind this week. You are listening to the Costa Report, and I am glad to have our listeners join us, particularly on our new stations in Boston, Miami, Chicago, Dallas, Texas, and Phoenix. Welcome to the Costa Report, and now stay tuned for our second hour. (music) 